observance night, half moon, going on towards new moon. Next week is the new moon night. This is the last, what is it, the, the 7th of February? This is the only event of February 1991, and it's all, and it will be over at midnight. It will be never again another 7 February 1991. Each day is completely unique in itself. It is like yesterday, February 6, 1991. There will never be another one in your your life ever again. Completely unique. Each day goes by. And each day is totally unique. And they all pass. And then when you get old, you just, they just, they even speed up. So life is like this. Remember when we began this retreat, we, we are accepting the all possibility, all that happens is a part of our practice. There's nothing that happens during this retreat that is not part of our practice of Dhamma. It's all reflection, recognition of all that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing, recognizing that that we can't find any kind of eternal soul or personal essence in any of these conditions. And then I am emphasize this is for investigation, not for belief. Uh, you're trying to find something uh, then you will you always be looking for you're always looking around for something, an object to find or discover. How many of you have been bitterly disappointed in this retreat because you haven't been able to find something? Find that your real self or that that which knows. How how many of you want to find the one who knows? Where is it? You know, and you keep looking, and maybe if I sit long enough or practice hard enough, I'll suddenly find it, I'll suddenly awaken to that ultimate reality. And that very desire is the obstacle, isn't it? That desire, that assumption, we're working with the immediacy of the desires that, that even motivate us into practicing meditation, becoming Buddhist monks and nuns. Some of you look pretty glum and miserable because you you don't know how to let go of anything. You're just so obsessed with yourselves. You think about yourselves all the time, and you and it's a create problems. You go around and around with all the earth, with all these thoughts and views and things. You never transcend it. Become so interested, so centered on yourself. And there isn't any self. But you you get caught in that pattern. That's the avicca bhajaya sankara, sankara bhajaya vinyanang, and so forth. Sometimes it weighs just a, a sigh of relief. Just nothing to do, nowhere to go, nothing to become. Just here and now. And yet, you can create all kinds of problems about this monk, this nun, this lay person, the sangha, the community, Amravati, Buddhism, Theravada, Christianity, the world. And all this is just the, the proliferation, conceptual proliferation, the papancha of a mind that is caught in ignorance, avicca, and then the Bajaya Papancha, Sankaras, in this proliferation, which are absolutely uh, without any essence, any substance, anything real, they're just figments of the mind, phantoms, specters. Tis we who lost in stormy visions keep with phantoms an unprofitable strife, and in mad trance strike with our spirit's knife in vulnerable nothings. That's what you're doing. 
And in mad trance, strike with your spirit's knife in vulnerable nothings. And then you go around blaming people, making all kinds of somethings out of nothings. Now, weather is this way, isn't it? This is just uh, the the experience of cold and <coughs> snow and ice and and all that that brings. Being born means that we're subjected to the changing conditions of of the weather on this planet. This is just life. Life is like this. Uh, the human form with its sensitive nature and its feeling. It's going to feel cold when it's like this. Uh, this is what cold feels like. It's inconvenient, isn't it? It's not convenient. The snow it gets in the way and the ice uh, kind of freezes the plumbing and and it's just terribly inconvenient for us. It gets in the way of practice. If we could only create a, an environment where there is, is a, it, you know, we get this perfect uh, lifestyle with no inconveniences. But being, if being born means that we're going to be subject to inconvenience, it's just part of the part of the package. You get born, you're going to have a life of, filled with inconveniences, frustrations, irritations. Why do you think you shouldn't? What is so special about you that you think life shouldn't be inconvenient or irritating for you when it is for everyone? Being born is, is this, it's this way. It's filled with this, this kind of experience. So we reflect, we, we, we bring into our consciousness that life, this is what life is, what being born is about. Being born is, is, if we weren't born, we wouldn't be experiencing the cold. But because we're born, we have this body that's going to get cold when it snows and freezes and things like this. It's not Britain's fault, is it? We'll blame it on Britain. Wish we were one was in Tahiti and all this is, is just the, the silliness of a human mind. This is life. It feels like this. We're going to be irritated by each other and we're going to experience the ups and downs, highs and lows, elations, depressions of a sensitive situation. It's just the way it is. But the refuge isn't in high or low, is it? It's in knowing. It's in this cool, aware knowing of Dhamma, the Buddha seeing the Dhamma. Some of you see things in a very shallow way still. You're not, there's not much depth in how you interpret your experience. It's still very, uh, on a very kind of superficial level because you, you don't, you don't really investigate. You more or less form opinions. <coughs> Easy to just, just form opinions about things than to really investigate, to look into like the the pattern, all that, uh, the conditioned and the unconditioned, the born and the unborn. That that's a pattern. That is a reference <coughs> point. That is something to investigate. But how many of you still have minds of, uh, you know, like the he hurt my feelings and she doesn't love me anymore and. And I'm upset because he thinks that I said that she thought because they weren't exactly sure about what that other person was saying when when she was telling him about that incident that happened <laughs> ten years ago. <laughs> and then the old gossipy you know what, what I heard today? Do you know who has a crush on who? Do you know who has, has got eyes for who? 
And who heart who, who goes a bit fluttery when so and so comes around and all this is like and really it's disgusting, like you're in seventh grade again. So we find out that emotionally maybe we aren't very mature, we aren't very developed. I mean, some some people even, you know, have gone through uh, universities and still emotion on the on the heart level is still that le- you know that at that stage of of she loves me, she loves me not kind of emotional plane of kind of looking for for someone to to love me, someone to understand me, someone to nurture me, someone to to tell me what to do, someone to praise me, someone to appreciate me, somebody who will take care of me, somebody who will be my friend. How many of you want want a real close friend out of the song? Somebody, a special relationship like Margaret Thatcher has with Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> Where does this come from, this desire to have special relationship, a meaningful uh, sharing and, uh, as, you know, a, an intimacy in that with somebody else, even on a platonic basis in the Sangha, we can't get into an intimacy, uh, too much intimacy without breaking the rules, but a certain level of favoritism and preference. But this is this also is quite natural. We certainly find uh, affinities in preferring certain people over others. It's just the way it is. But we're here to see the Dhamma, not to not to develop this, not to make this into something. Not that's not what we're here for. That's not what we are expecting. Uh, it's not the way out of suffering. So we contemplate our own, the way we react and uh, respond to the life that we're living here. We study it, we reflect on it, we learn from it. And from whatever Wherever we happen to be, on whatever, don't be a, don't be frightened of your emotions, but just try to to accept them and know them for what they are. Admit them into consciousness. So we're not trying to act like mature monks and nuns and and uh, and suppress our feelings, but in this life we can at least allow the the emotional nature when in its in its uh, immaturity in that to be a consciously experienced because it's when we allow these fears and desires emotional <clears throat> conditions into consciousness that we can uh, understand them understand them as dhammas when you understand something then you can let it go when you let it go then you realize the the uh, cessation, and when you realize the cessation of a condition, then you realize, then you have that insight into the eightfold path. <clears throat> it is an ongoing uh, and determined effort we have to apply because we, it takes time to release. It's not you're going to suddenly have a big catharsis and then transformed overnight into this totally kind of uh, balanced, mature, wise, uh, compassionate creature. One can have insights, but, but still it takes time to wear away, to let go and to realize cessation from coarse to the more subtle refinements of clinging and grasping the sad news of the uh, the the uh, the first uh, when the uh, Iraqi troops invaded last week, 
or crossed over the Kuwait border into Saudi Arabia and attacked, the first Americans killed were six or seven Marines who were killed, but they were killed by Americans and by accident. So the first, say, the first body bag sent back to America. They talk about body bags. First body bags were American Marines killed by the Americans. That's ironic, isn't it? Who's the enemy? Now, <laughs> if you're one of those Marines, dead, you know, you know, they get killed by the, your your uh, your your own countrymen rather than those than those uh, evil uh, Iraqis. We all know the Iraqis are evil, but when you get killed by the, the angelic, uh, pure white American troops, something's wrong, isn't it? Can't trust anyone. And President Bush is uh, on a kind of, um, he's on a high, elated, an elation of America's the best country and, and the, we're setting the tone for the future and America is going to direct the world into the right paths in the future and America is, is so, so stupid and so uh, exaggerated that you just cringe. If you're American, you feel embarrassed. I tell people now I'm from Uruguay. (laughs) (laughs) But this is the way the world is. It's like this. At this stage of its development, humanity is like this. Nations, superpowers, and all this. These are these are the conceptual proliferations that we we tend to regard as reality and put a lot of importance upon. We give it gravity. We make it real for ourselves. We worry. We endlessly proliferate and get carried away with our strong feelings about these kind of things, about Iraqis and and uh, tyrannical dictators and demagogues and and, uh, all the kind of the alliance forces and who's helping and who's dragging their feet and who's uh, pushing ahead and who's the who's the good one who are the good ones and who are the bad ones and, and this goes on and on and on into uh, this the the problems that come out of ignorance and will never really be solved they just change from problems just change. To resolve problems is is what we're trying to do here. This way of, of reflecting, meditating, understanding the nature of the mind, not blaming somebody else, because we can see blaming is is a is a condition of the mind. If we can't do it, if we can't really penetrate reality uh, under the, uh, when the, all the conditions here are encouraging that kind of realization, then then we can't very well be too hard on Saddam Hussein or George Bush or anyone else. They're just products of the same ignorant processes that 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 keep us in a state of blaming other people and feeling sorry for ourselves and. Being, and believing our own views and opinions and feelings as being real and important. I mean, these people, Saddam Hussein, George Bush, seem to unpower positions of power that we we aren't in. But it's the same problem, the same avicca, budjaya, sankara problem. So one one realizes it's it's. We can uh, be quite uh, condemning and self-righteous about them, but just watch yourself. Just see where where all of that really begins. Just notice 
your your own conceit and arrogance and your own tendency to blame and to to love and hate and to to want to get even and seek revenge and want to to hurt somebody else or want to um, hurt yourself or blame yourself. It goes both directions, doesn't it? It goes inward, outward. Once, uh, if you if you don't spot it, if you don't really uh, recognize avicca, bhajaya, sankara, then of course you're you're always uh, being carried away by that particular sequence. You start out from ignorance, then you just go on and on, round and around with with the result of that ignorance. Identification with the body, identification with the feelings, identification with the perceptions, identification with the volitions, identification with consciousness. Now each one of us believes from our own perspective. Like if you, like for George Bush, he sees Saddam Hussein as a tyrant that's in the way. When Saddam Hussein was fighting, and he actually, you know, when he invaded Iran eight, nine years ago, uh, the Americans were all for it. They didn't want to encourage him to go ahead because they didn't like that. They, those days, they they were pretty fed up with Ayatollah Khomeini. Get rid of that bloke, and then uh, Saddam Hussein seemed a much better kind of. I mean, he was a pretty rotten egg himself, but it, but you, you're you quite willing to go to bed with rotten eggs if they're going to... <laughs> if they're going to do what you want. I mean, you've got prostitutes. So, that uh, Saddam Hussein in those days was not... Uh, we, one didn't want to think of him as a rotten egg. One wanted to think of him as one who is going to get rid of the, a, a really rotten egg. So you, you have a way, you can overlook the fact that he murdered all the Kurdish people, a lot of Kurdish people used biological chemical weapons and, and set up a most tyrannical police state in Iraq for years and has been responsible for endless murders and deaths and terrorism, one can suddenly just kind of, it doesn't really matter, you know, just, you know, just his way of dealing with problems. And <laughs> but now, Ayatollah Khomeini is no longer a problem, Iran is neutralized, and Saddam Hussein now is the focus. Now, I imagine Saddam Hussein, if you ask him, he's got his own version about, you know, how he is trying to create this Arab, uh, pan-Arab nationalism and, and bring justice to the, to the uh, Muslims and the Arabs who've been mistreated and, and taken advantage of, exploited by colonialism, Western powers. And those blasted Kuwaitis with their selfish little snobs, those kind of prissy little twits down in Kuwait who just, you know, live and drive around in Cadillacs and Rolls Royces and and uh, live high on the hog. Muslims don't live high on the hog, though, do they? <laughs> they can't eat pork. <laughs> live in this very kind of uh, splendid way and won't cough up the, the dough when you need it. After all you've done for him, I mean, they, after all, Saddam Hussein helped uh, control, has helped stop the uh, all the uh, like Ayatollah Khomeini with his Shiite fanatics, and stopped that from taking over the Middle East. And so he he feels <laughs> very much that Kuwait is just a pain in the neck. They deserve to be absolutely smashed, mesmerized. Uh, pulverized, destroyed, annihilated, and incorporated into Kuwait because they are, they were, they were just totally ungrateful, selfish creatures. So he's, he's got his own version of that Kuwait is a, is, deserved exactly what it got. So, 
according to George Bush, Kuwait was one of the better Islamic countries. It was never caused any problems to the United States. It was, it was it had certain things lacking. Yes, it wasn't terribly democratic, but it was was little more than Iraq. And uh, so that these are these how how people view and see things, isn't it? Each in how many of you do that here? How many of you look at each other and have form opinions or feel indignant or feel self righteous and and see things of how somebody did this to me and how this was done to me and that person was wrong. And yet you go to the person that you're condemning and you ask them and they see it also in a different way. They in their own self righteous uh, interpretation and version. Why is the world like this? Why can't there be kind of absolute rights and wrongs? Why can't right be be an absolute? Pure white, right, and black is wrong, and it's absolutely wrong, and everybody knows it's wrong, and 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 it there's no doubt about it. Why can't life be just black and white, absolutely right and absolutely wrong, clear cut? Why does it have to be so? complicated and com- uh, and convoluted you, when you hear this person's version and that person's version and you're trying to find which one is right which one is wrong which one is telling a lie which one is telling the truth you realize that there, it's not a matter of absolute right and wrong or true and false that life is like this each person experiences life from where they are and how they see it and the sensitivity they have, or the lack of it, their interpretations, their this is the what they what how they're feeling, how one is, how one is uh, experiencing a situation, an experience, how one is is feeling an experience, or perceives it, or interprets it this way, and it's not going to be the same, is it? It's not absolute. Right or wrong, right and wrong are relative, and this is where w- w- we find ourselves getting confused because you think you're the one who's wrong, you're the one who who told me, who said that nasty thing to me. You're wrong, and if you think I'm going to apologize to you, you're crazy because you're the one that's wrong. You should be apologizing to me. So then you go to the other person and you say. Well, this person said, thinks that you're wrong. After all, you did say something pretty awful to them, and and they just, you know, they they you, they can't. And they, you're wrong. You should never have said that to them. And then you find out, well, you know, the reason why I said that was because, um, and they have very good reason for saying that, according to the way they think. You can justify anything, uh, robbing a bank or stealing a loaf of bread or, or, or murdering your wife. There's all kinds of good excuses. One can justify and defend any kind of action in a kind of self-righteous way. How many people really would, would, would can, uh, would, you know, the, and, Will uh, just say I'm I'm wrong. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have acted like that. That was wrong. Or to know what was right, what you really felt, what you really, what your intention was, and have confidence in that. But not to hold to a, a stubborn position. Uh, to to a position out of stubbornness and conceit and arrogance and pride. To be able to bend and flow, to learn, to to learn how to to be with life in as a flowing as experience of impermanence and change. Consciousness is a stream of flowing experience, being a conscious being. When you're with, when you're mindful, then you're with the flow of consciousness. It's like this. There's the knowing of the flow of change. There's no fixed position. There's nothing to, to become, nothing to do, nothing to, 
to get rid of because life is this way. Consciousness is like this. We are, con- we are experiencing consciousness. The more mindful we are, the more conscious we are. Many of you aren't really conscious in, in, in through mindfulness. You're so caught up in your own loves and hates that you become stupid and insensitive. You don't see things in the right way. You're always interpreting things in the wrong way. You're always looking at things from from the wrong view, from from something from a distortion, through a, through a, a a dirty piece of glass or dust or filth or something that is that distorts and makes things look very different which is your own uh, creation. You create this, this film, this, this scum over your mind and heart. And then you think that, that that's the real world. You think the scum and the, that, that nasty, sticky surface you create in your mind is, is the way life is. Or you blame it. You know, I'm this way because of this and that. But the, recognize that that the what the Buddha is saying in his teachings is that our refuge is in that pure knowing, the purity of the mind and heart, the pure-heartedness of loving, of being, of being conscious. What is purity then? What is it when, when 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 the mind is pure? Do you what is that? The experience and knowing and being pure is through realization, not through becoming. You can't become somebody who's pure because that whole idea of becoming somebody is based on avicca bhajaya sankar, based on the illusion. So as long as you're trying to become somebody who Who's going to become pure? You know, you're creating re- this this scummy uh, film over your over your heart. It just gets thicker and thicker. Pretty soon, you you don't even know you have a heart. You just go through the motions of habit. End up as one of these these kind of wretched old people that just say the same thing over and over again. Play bingo and. Watch television till you die. I wonder what life was all about. Or read true love or true romance stories and um, live on the surface of of sentiment. When we investigate the five khandhas, don't don't think that this is just a Wu Pang Ani Chang Wei Din Ani Cha kind of chant. This is a real. This is what we're. This is what we learn from. From the bodies we have, from the feelings, from the perceptions, volitions, and consciousness. This is this is what we investigate. And we have it right here and now, isn't it? It's here and now, Dhamma. This body. This body is here and now. And it will be till it dies. Wherever you go, your body's always here and now, isn't it? Now that's Santiti Kali Kodama. To be seen, to be understood, because this is the way it is. Where you you go to the toilet, your body, you take your body with you. Imagine leaving your body here, go to the toilet. <laughs> Whether you're sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, your body is is involved in that. So that's this is what we have. The body is something to investigate. Investigation is what we have. We're investigating it, not judging it. Whether we like it or don't like it, or whether it's good or bad, or it's better or worse than somebody else's, or we wish it were more this way and less that way. That's not that's not investigation. That's vanity and stupidity. It's the body is like this. 
it feels like this. Its energies are like this. Its organs are like this. Its quality, it's the experience of it. And we also recognizing it as, uh, as it, uh, as quite subjectively. The way it feels. What does it feel like to, to have weight? To be, to have this, uh, a weighty body. A body that weighs something. That feels cold or hot or neither hot nor cold. A body that has pain and and uh, pleasure, pleasurable sensations. A body that that is an energy form in itself, isn't it? Made of the we contemplate the four elements of earth, fire, water, and air. That's just a, a an upai or skillful way of contemplating. Uh, uh, that which the which the the body uh, is say in, in in a discriminative way. What is the solid element or the earth element, the liquid, the fire, and the air element? We do thirty two parts of the body. Is not to to not, we're not thinking of of anatomical accuracy, but of just a, a, a way of meditating and looking at the body contemplating that which is here and now. The 32 parts of the body are here and now, aren't they? They're not, they're not uh, just uh, psychological abstractions. When we talk about oil of the joints, we're, we're talking about something that's here and now, isn't it? We all have joints with oil in them. Mudang, urine. Well, these bodies are all filled with urine. Well, not totally filled, but (laughs) bladders and that. Urine is in these bodies. It's a different, that's a different, what does that do when you, when you look at somebody and think of them uh, as having urine inside them and when you think of them as a person or a man or a woman? It's different, isn't it? It's a different feeling when you when I look at you as a personality. He's like this, she's like that. That's different than when I contemplate the reality of urine or bones or blood. So uh, investigating you, you see the and yet each one of you has blood in your body right now, don't you? Blood isn't such, urine is a bit embarrassing, isn't it? Urine is something one doesn't like to uh, particularly identify with. Blood is okay. We're kind of noble to give blood, go down to Birkenstead and offer your donate your blood, but who wants your urine? <laughs> it's just, when, when one has to urinate, you go someplace to do it where nobody's going to see and kind of flush it away as conveniently as possible. We have these incredible kind of plumbing these days. Just think of the plumbing here at Amramanti, just to get carry away urine. <laughs> and yet, urine is here and now, isn't it? Urine and blood and bones, muscles and oil of the joint, brain, pus and fat kidneys liver these these are we're investigating we're, we're recognizing that this is the way it is this is this is the way life is this isn't just playing games with the mind but it's it's bringing into our consciousness the way it is that isn't, we're not making it, we're not judging it on the personal level, whether I like it, don't like it, or, or whose blood is better than whose pus, who has more pus, who has less. Whose oil of the joints is, who has more or less, we wouldn't think in terms of comparing each other's oil of the joints, would we? But on the level of appearance, we can say, who has the biggest nose? Who has the prettiest eyes? 
who has the, the nicest complexion? Who's the tallest? Who's the shortest? Who's the fattest? Who's the skinniest? Who's the whitest, the darkest? And like this, are these on the surface of what we see, because we, we pay so much attention, we give so much gravity to eye consciousness. Reason why sometimes uh, contemplating the blood in the body doesn't seem so real to us, say, as, as the perceptions we have through our eyes of this person, saying that this, this is Chandasiri, she is a real person because I see her. She has a birth certificate and a passport that prove. And that's the reality because of eye consciousness and the belief and uh, attachment to a perception. It's a perception, isn't it? Chandasiri is a perception of my mind. It comes and goes in my mind. You say, where is Chandasiri right now? You all point to her. But, but actually, Chandasiri is a perception in my mind. So instead of, of making a lot about the personal perceptions that we create, one starts looking at the... the, the one can perceive the blood. The, we, we can't see it, but we know, don't we? We all know that that everyone in sitting in this room has blood coursing through their veins and arteries. So that's that's here and now number. That is, and what does that perception do? What does that kind of investigation do to the mind? It's different, isn't it, than when you're when you're just reacting to them on the personal level of a man or a woman, a monk or a nun. Um, this person and that person or this person's position or that person's personality or I like this one I get on I have great affinities with this one I don't like that one I don't have anything to do I don't have anything in common with that one blah 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 blah. and it gets all very uh, we get caught up in our preferences loves and hates opinions and views where investigating no, the uh, how the mind works. What what brings strong feeling? What brings the passions? Certainly, the contemplation of oil of the joints doesn't arouse any passions in me. When I look at you all, and think that every one of you in this room has oil in your joints. Another feel particularly uh, kind of elated or depressed or. I don't feel attracted or repelled. I don't even know what oil of the joint looks like. Spit or snot. Remember when we used to chant and the mucus, we used to say snot and everybody giggles. Because <laughs> snot is an amusing word, isn't it? Not. <laughs> we had to change it to mucus because he couldn't help but giggle. Now this 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 Gyanupasana is establishing in consciousness through through conscious investigation the way it is. It's it's a, it's cool. It's it's deliberate. It's wise. It's it's not not to kind of annihilate the personality or to just start seeing uh, each other as as snot or or urine or blood or whatever. But it it if we if we really establish the way it is. Then there, the, the, then we have a something to to uh, refer to. We have we have established uh, this sense of reality of what is real, of what is true, in order to begin to see just our own kind of views and opinions, personal preferences, fears and desires that that we tend to 
regard and believe in. We God is real, reality, and we believe in, and we we suffer so much, create so much anguish and despair in our minds, in our hearts, over whether somebody likes us or doesn't, or whether we like somebody or don't, or whether we're worthy or unworthy, or whether we're loved or when nobody loves me, or this kind of, whether I'm right or wrong. And the, the whole personal realm is is that kind of, is that endless uh, uh, agitation of the mind. What he thinks, what they think, how they, what they said, what was done to me, what happened to me, how I was mistreated, how I was taken advantage of, what I've done, how the bad things I've done in my life, and and it just and one becomes totally kind of uh, overwhelmed and flooded, inundated with oneself, this sense of a self. It takes over the mind. We can just sit all day and think about ourselves. Me and mine. What happened to me and what I did and what should have happened, how it should be and it's not fair and I don't like and I want. And it go, uh, we can spend a whole lifetime just on that plane of self, of emotions, of grudges, of vengeance, of love and hate. Liking and disliking, but in when we establish uh, the the reality of a situation, we're re- a reality is realizing the way it is. This is consciousness. It's like this, and there's, there's the breathing. There's the sound of silence. There's uh, the body. Is 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 sitting. Standing, walking, lying down. It's this way. The male body, what is it like? The female body, what is what is that like? If you if you're a, if you have a female body, what is it? What is it? What is femininity? What is masculinity? Now these people don't say what is femininity. They, they tend to have preferences. Women are better than men, or men are better than women, or all these kind of views and opinions about uh, the sexual nature of the body. Just waste of time. If whatever kind of body you have, there's only two kinds, male and female, and if whatever one you have, you investigate it. What is it? How does it affect the mind? Don't be frightened of it. Don't be, it's nothing to be frightened of. It's something to understand. Then the Vedana is, as I've said before, the, the attraction aversion and neither attraction nor aversion. The magnetic pull of or the, or the mm-hmm. repulsion That we feel through the senses or through the mind, the heart. How this Vedana is this way. We're taking just this subject of Vedana Nupasana and we're, we're, we're investigating it. Make it something usable for yourself. There's not an absolute uh, true way of, of uh, regarding Vedana, but what, what is a convenient and useful way of of using this term Vedana around what your what your own experience of life. What is Vedana is a is a, a sukha tuka a tuka matuka Vedana. The happiness, the the pleasure, the pain, and neither pleasure nor pain, or you can be pleasure through the eye, uh, or displeasure through the eye consciousness, and so forth. It's the Vedana then has this. This attraction, repulsion, and neutral quality to it. So we we find ourselves attracted to something that's Vedana. Just the, wanting to have a second look. That's Vedana. 
look at the let's say a beautiful flower and you want to that's vedana it's a sukha vedana isn't it wanting to to look that that sense of of enjoying the happiness the pleasure that the sense of attraction rather than uh, toward the beautiful or being repelled by the ugly or atuka matsuka vedana where neither attraction listen everything is not attractive or repulsive most of it's quite neutral neither pleasure nor pain this way but to recognize atuka matsuka vedana you have to investigate vedana you have to bring it into a conscious experience of knowing vedana is this way Then sanya and jitanu uh, pasana sadipatana, the mind, the heart, the the emotion, the complicated emotions. Whether your heart feels feels liberated or oppressed, whether your heart feels confused or clear, whether you feel expansive or restricted or uptight, whether you feel uh, contented or discontented, satisfied or unsatisfied, whether your mind is bright or dull. Jitanu pasana, sadibhatana. you reflecting on the jitta, on the heart. So you, you, you're looking at this, just the the mood you're in. Not judging it, but recognizing this is a mood. Confusion is like this. Like sometimes you, you just find yourself, like if I get a lot of negative things coming at me at all at once, like bad news and complaints and and um, unpleasant uh, suggestions to my mind, there's this lingering mood, this kind of unpleasant feeling in the mind, in my heart. In the kind of, it could go into worry or being kind of despairing or fed up. Something. If you didn't recognize it as just a condition of the mind, of the heart, it's just this way. It's it's nothing more than this this as it is now. It's this way. This feeling of being confused or of everything being something wrong with the world or something wrong with me or something wrong with, with something's going wrong something's not right and if if you aren't reflecting on it as jitanu pasana sadibhadana then you you tend to either indulge in it oh everything's going wrong I don't know what to do or you know, I shouldn't think like that you're trying to get rid of it I should have faith in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and I shouldn't be get so upset by this. I should just you know, try to dismiss it and get rid of it, be a good sport, forget it, push it out of the way. Those are the two uh, extremes. And then the understanding of that, the Jitanu Pasana Saribhatana, is it's like this when when a lot of unpleasant uh, when bad news or gloom doom or criticisms or things seem not right and everything seems to be going off it feels like this it's just this feeling now it's nothing more than that so there's this this knowing this pure kind of knowing of that may be very kind of amorphous, uncertain mental state, of the feeling in your heart of not being sure, of being insecure, of being confused, of being uh, something wrong, of being discontented. It's like this. I, when I, when I, I really bring into my consciousness feeling 
uh, despair is like this. I really look at it. It's it's this way. I know it as a feeling, as a as a as a as a, a heartfelt experience. And I know it is is just that. It's nothing more than that. It, it has no real essential nature. It is it's not ultimate reality. It's nothing. It, it, it dissolves, disappears when you see it in, for what it is. Nothing that is, is has has a reality. It's just the 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 heart. It feels like this. If if a lot of unpleasant things happen to us at one time, it feels this way. It's the natural feeling. But when there's not this this uh, understanding, then one tends to think it shouldn't be like this. I shouldn't feel like this. The world shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't snow like this. The pipe shouldn't freeze like that. It's not fair. This is uh, what if and what if things? What if we can't get them on frozen? And what'll happen when they thaw? And we we'll have explosions and burst pipes. And then we're going to spend lots of money on plumbing. And 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 we've got to. And then and it's cold and uh, it's just so many things could go wrong. And, and then some of them. Monks look pretty kind of uncertain, and the anagarikas go a bit bonkers, and the and the nuns start looking oppressed and frustrated and getting sick and going into their kind of world of feeling weak and sickly. Oh, it's just. But this is this is the way it is. Sometimes everything goes wrong. Sometimes everything goes right. Sometimes some things go wrong. Some things are right. <coughs> Sometimes some uh, thirty, uh, uh, say, three quarters uh, are right and one quarter is wrong. And sometimes one half is right and one half is wrong. Sometimes one-fourth is right and three-quarters are wrong. Sometimes one-third is right, two-thirds wrong. Do you get the point? (laughs) (laughs) We're born into a realm where this is the way it is. Why make a problem about it? Why... Who are, who are you to think that it should be otherwise? If this is the way it is, then, then all we have to do, we don't need, we needn't suffer from it when we understand it as it is. Our suffering comes from not understanding things as they are. We always think that life should be something else, that, that, that it shouldn't be this way, or I shouldn't be this way, or you shouldn't be this way, and it should be, we all we all know, have our views about how everything should be, but the way out of suffering is through understanding suffering, not through annihilating it. The way out of suffering is by letting go of the causes of suffering. And the way out of suffering is by realization of the end of suffering. And the, then the way out of suffering is developing that that path, that way out of suffering in, in our daily lives. How do you do that? How do you develop that path in daily life here at Amravati, here and now, in this this evening? Developing the path, cultivating the way, mindfulness, patience. You're in a refuge. You've got the force, the power of a Buddha Dhamma Sangha to support you. And trust in that. So when you when you re, when you have that refuge, then you can in you you have the right, and you have the ability, and you have the opportunity to investigate Dhamma, 
in all its aspects. The good, the bad, the high, the low, the clear, the confused, the the evil, the the angelic, the devas, the devils, the demons, the pretas, the whole lot one can look at as Dhamma. One has the right, one has the occasion, one has the refuge, one is supported in this refuge of mindfulness, truth, virtuousness, in which we can look at demons honestly and just recognize the demon as a condition rather than as uh, that rather than react to it with fear. <coughs> but above all, be very patient and and uh, don't don't try to to become enlightened. Don't try to make yourself enlightened. Don't really observe, really get to know the, that in you which forces and pushes and aggresses and, and uh, is compulsive and obsessive and has to and must and should and shouldn't. And, and this, this, because we're so, we are those kind of creatures, aren't we? In the Western world, very much modern uh, humanity in, the, in this the European American conditioning is a very compulsive one. The hard work, the getting getting things done, efficiency, and and uh, work, 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 and don't uh, you know really uh, don't waste time. Make it happen. And recognize in in, uh, in the refuge, you're, there's there's this that, that one is is uh, willing to put forth effort, but it's it's not out of compulsion, but out of wisdom, mindfulness and wisdom. It's different. When we're operating out of mindfulness, wisdom, then effort and and work, right action, right livelihood, all that is is in proportion. It's not an obsession, not compulsive doing. It's not guilt-ridden and forced and and full of uh, commandments and threats. The kindest thing we can do for each other is to is to let go of our views about each other. To not not believe in the perceptions we have, as if those perceptions were the actual person. To to really uh, see to develop. The, if you're going to perceive, see the perception of sangha rather than of person. This person and that person. This is sangha. We're working as sangha rather than me and you. Senior and, and junior and all this. These uh, insidious kind of ego problems, aren't they? Uh, when, you get, when you're in a hierarchy, you get really concerned about your position. You get really upset if somebody junior to you goes ahead of you. How many of you get upset if somebody junior to you goes ahead of you? Or sits in your place. What happens to your mind if somebody, some junior person, sits in your seat? And it can be someone just maybe one year junior. <laughs> you can go berserk, can't you? You can ruin your day. What if somebody like a junior? None more than a senior nun. What if, what if a lot of people like a junior nun prefer a junior nun to a senior nun? What happens? What happens to your mind? These are the things to to investigate, to not not analyze, not try to figure out. I shouldn't feel like this. I should not care and all that. I'm not asking you to do to 
to go around feeling guilty and uh, trying to pretend that you are trying to to uh, pretend that you don't feel anything, but recognize that this is just these are the results of attachment to being somebody, being in a position. You know what attachment is. If you're jealous uh, uh, or, or or feel uh, somehow upset by by such incidences, it's because of attachment. So you study that attachment. Realize we're not here to have a position in a hierarchy. Who gives a damn whether it's junior, senior? It's totally irrelevant to the practice. Uh, we, this is just a. a Part of we have to ha- hierarchy is a part of nature. It's not a position to take or an identity to have. So we're not here to to identify with a position in a in a structure, but to learn from the position we're in about dhamma. So then you can then there's wisdom, there's mindfulness, there's liberation from suffering. How many of you want to to be teachers and want to be important people, want to be appreciated by others or want to be recognized or or feel that you're somebody who who has who who's um, has a lot to offer somebody else or all these these kind of attitudes or feel that you you can't you 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 you're not, you're not getting anywhere or that you're senior to somebody else, but you're you're not as good as they are, or all these these kind of emotional feelings we have are due to attachment. We shouldn't feel like this if we're if, if we're our hearts and we, we we shouldn't be upset if if a junior monk sits on sits on my seat. I shouldn't shouldn't feel anything. I should just feel maybe mudita that. That he's in a comfortable seat, because usually my seats are more comfortable than the others. They put all these kind of crocheted seat covers on and triangular pillows and velvet zafus and want some. Some little snippet comes and sits on my zafu. Dare, oh, I should I shouldn't feel like that. I should. Oh, how how wonderful! That that junior monk is sitting on my zafu. I'm so happy for him. Or is it just an opportunity to observe a feeling of annoyance? Maybe maybe annoyance is justified. Maybe it's a cheeky and insensitive thing to do on the part of the junior monk. But but it, that's still his problem rather than mine, isn't it? So we learn. We have to learn from our jealousies and our uh, feelings of of self-importance and our determination to hold on to a position and and uh, to assert ourselves in a, in the hierarchy i'm senior to you and you're only junior and you're only a nun and you uh, you're only not a garika and uh, i'm i'm been here longer than you have and i know more than you do and all this kind of, these are the, these are arrogant Conceited uh, reactions to life, which are to be could be seen as dhammas, that which arises, or can be it can be endless sources of pain and suffering for yourself and for the rest of us. Just notice, like in the, with men, what reactions of men to each other on the worldly plane. You know, just kind of the, the male aggressiveness. That's what it's like to. To want to to push somebody out of the out of you know they're in the way and and they're in your place to to kind of physically push them out to 
to be aggressive physically. I mean, and there's a strong tendency to be physically aggressive among men. And to, to feel competitive with other men. It's a very common feeling. Or to feel that, that somebody's trying to dominate me, some man is trying to assert himself over me. You know, I'm not going to let him. I'm not a wimp. I'm going to, I'm going to like be two bulls with locked horns. This is this is a a, a, a problem that men have. Men are, are really uh, being frightened and and asserting oneself against another. Or just submitting, isn't it? Just, just being obedient or going along. Being a good sport, being a good guy, all this kind of thing. What I don't want, not being a woman, how do women relate to each other as a group? What are the things that come up as far as the feminine principles and the re- and emotional reactions with each other and how you tend to to react in, in regards to just living uh, with other women the community of women it's to to study and to investigate this not to identify to know and to understand this is the karma this is the vipaka karma of having been born as a man or woman these are these are patterns and and archetypal patterns. And you can you can see it in legends and in and in myths. Just the whole the whole these are conditions that we experience, but which we're transcending through mindfulness and wisdom. Because we're we're getting beyond this this whole rebirth process. We want to be reborn as a man or woman. Then, then follow those feelings, attach to it, become that way. Really identify with being a woman or a man, and really, and then, and then in the next life you'll be reborn again as a man or woman. Big deal, isn't it? Certainly not worth it, is it? To be born as either a man or woman is not. It's a waste of time to make that your your goal, your aim for your life. When when we have this other, this this uh, this opportunity to realize truth, transcendent, transcending these mort- this mortal realm, this conditioned realm, this realm of sorrow and despair, separation from the love. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise. This is this realm of death, of separation. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise. So contemplate this. Do you want to be reborn and into these states constantly? I mean, we're doing it all the time. Every time you you blindly react in those ways and through indulging or suppressing that's another rebirth you've conditioned yourself to become that way over and over it becomes habitual it becomes you become entrenched in that in that reaction so so have the have the courage and confidence to really look recognize but not identify how do you do that to really note, to observe, to see the the dhamma of it, the anicca dukkha anatta of conditioned phenomena. So tonight is the observance night, and some of you probably are pretty tired, aren't you? Uh, huh? <laughs> from the day's activities, shoveling snow and climbing under the sala and climbing up in attics and 
going all over the place. You see legs hanging out here and there. <laughs> Remember that first winter here with Venerable Subito and Chandapala and I just I just saw their legs <laughs> sticking out from under these buildings. They were lying on their backs trying to repair all these pipes. I actually forgot what they looked like. I just recognized their legs. Venerable Subito is there, his legs. 